My name is Trevor Creighton and I'm the Projects Coordinator at Butza. What we've got going on here is uh, an experimental construction of a Neolithic structure. So something was excavated and we know it was dated to the late Stone Age or the Neolithic as it's known um, and we're trying to interpret what was found in the ground as a building. We had a, an earlier building here which was called the Schlandergei House. Um, it was based on archaeology from Wales. It was a slightly smaller building than the one that's replacing it, which is Horton II, this house here. It was about 12 metres uh, long by 6 metres wide, and it seemed to be a built, uh, the original archaeology suggests it was built of quite slight timbers. So it was um, a fairly conventional long house. It had posts down the middle of it to help support the roof and um, fairly light timbers and um, light walls. It looked a little bit like a, a long modern bungalow. Um, being lightly built though, it wasn't very resistant to, to the effects of weather. So over the course of four or five years, it gradually became structurally a little bit compromised by winds, which meant that um, earlier or late last year, we needed to replace it. We decided to replace it with quite a different structure, with another piece of archaeology. Um, as we're experimental, we wanted to do another experiment. The archaeology comes from a, a gravel quarry uh, at a place called Horton, which is not far away from Slough and Heath Heathrow Airport. Um, what we've done there is, uh, it was excavated by Wessex Archaeology, and they have found a ground plan. It's, it's essentially a trench, and the trench goes around the perimeter of a, a structure, which is around 15 metres uh, long, and on average it's about seven and a half metres wide. And the trench looks like it was filled originally with timber. It's very hard to say because this building dates from about as far back as 5,800 years ago. So it's actually hard to say what was in that trench, but it's stained dark and the dark stains tell us it's almost certainly been filled with timber at some stage. So when you want to make an assessment of any archaeology, you have, I think it's fair to say, three ways you can look at that archaeology to try and figure out what it is and what it was. Um, the first is evidence. So if you find something that's shaped like a pot, because you know what a pot looks like in the modern world, it's probably a pot. Now, if that pot has um, markings on it or a certain shape that's very similar to another pot that you know, and you know where that pot comes from for other reasons, then you can probably say, well, this pot is like that pot. So this pot probably represents a certain culture, a certain group of people, and a certain point in time. The third thing you have is assumption. Now, in the ordinary world, assumptions might be called guesses. What we have with the Horton House is evidence in the form of a large trench, a couple of post holes, each of which are apparently filled with a dark material, which we think is probably wood. But a lot of what we have to do from there is make assumptions. So what filled those trenches and post holes, we don't exactly know. As I said, we think it's wood, but what the wood was doing, we don't know. So the first assumption we've made with the Horton House is that it had a roof. And that's actually a very important assumption, of course. Just because something has post holes and a trench, there's no reason to think it has a roof. It could be a corral for animals. It could be a ritual structure beloved of archaeologists. Um, it could be all sorts of things. It could be a, literally a pile of timber that was dumped there and rotted. Very unlikely in the case of this building because it's very regular. So it's almost a, a, a regular rectangle. It's slightly wider in the middle than it is at the ends and one of the ends tapers quite significantly. Um, so you call it a trapezoid rather than a rectangle. That's an interesting thing in itself. So when we're faced with this big building, unlike any of the others that I described, there's a, there are thousands, literally thousands of known Neolithic houses in Europe. They conform to a fairly well-known plan that I described earlier, which has post holes and fairly clear walls. They're quite easy to understand in terms of how do you put a roof on that. With Horton, because what you have is quite a big building at seven metres wide, 
um, but very few post holes, in fact only two post holes in the middle of the building, the question becomes how do you put a roof over quite a big space? In the modern world it's quite easy, we could use steel, we could use pieces, large pieces of timber all tied together with gang nails or with bolts or in the case of steel it could be welded. In the late stone age the question becomes how do you use your technology to create a roof that straddles quite a big gap? So to put it in context, a seven metre gap was quite a big gap. So a seven metre space across this building is quite a big gap even in the Middle Ages to say nothing of five and a half thousand years ago. So from that archaeology we had to make certain assumptions about if it had a roof, how the roof was made. So what we we've done with that is assume that there were pieces of timber that went into the ground around the edge of the buildings and they filled post holes. So the structure itself was supported by timber that was um, buried quite deeply into post holes at the end of the building. Also some in the middle of the building. So you can see behind me here there are a couple of posts. Um, those posts we think did a job helping support the structure. Now, just to put a couple of posts in the ground and put a roof on it is not going to keep a building up. So from some archeological investigations of buildings, you get a really good indication of what the walls were in the archeology. span In this case, um, we don't. As I mentioned before, we know that the walls were probably timber. It certainly looks like it had walls of some sort but we can't tell from the archaeology what the walls actually might have been like, how high they were, any of those sorts of things. So this building's been designed from the top down, quite literally. As I mentioned before, we have this really quite large space of about seven metres that we have to span, and that suggests to us that we need a way of tying the two sides of the building. Because if we just make a, a, a sort of lean-to roof, you've got a house of cards that will just fall over. The other thing that we know is that the place where it was uh, originally found, at Horton, um, is still quite a damp area, but we know that in, in the period of the Neolithic, it was very wet, so there were wetlands there. Um, so that means that if a building has a roof, you've got to cover it. If you've got wetlands, you have lots of reeds. So it's a good assumption that the roof was covered with reeds. Now once you make that assumption, you're forced then to make the next choice, which is to have a roof that has a roof pitch, so the angle of the roof is about 45 to 50 degrees. Any less than that and the thatch will leak. Any more than that and it will start to want to fall off the roof. So already we've got the shape of the roof. It's an A-frame with 45 or 50 degree angles. So we have evidence about this building. We know it had a seven metre span. We have evidence about what it was made from in the form of the stains in the ground that tell us it's almost certainly timber. We have evidence that there were reeds in the location of the original archaeology. And then we have an assumption that it was reed roofed. So that gives us the shape of our roof. Given that we have this large A-frame roof that goes across seven metres, we know then that it has to somehow be tied together at the bottom, otherwise it collapses like that. So our roof is defined for us on the basis of first of all evidence and then assumptions. It's an A-frame roof, 45 to 50 degree pitch. That then raises the question of the walls. How or what uh, are we to design and build the walls? If we were building a modern bungalow, um, we would have our walls at somewhere around two or two and a half metres high. The reason for that is, is practicality. It really gives us good headspace all the way from one side of the building to, to the other. If we did that using Neolithic tools and Neolithic building materials, then we have a structural problem or a potential structural problem. So if we put a roof onto a wall, the roof starts to transfer its load down onto the walls and if the walls aren't very well secured they fall apart like that so our house collapses 
at the walls. Now the, the way we get around that in modern engineering is to tie the roof together. So as I mentioned before, we have a, a beam that stops the roof from spreading. And we have a thing called a wall plate. So the wall has uh, a top, a long beam that runs across the top of it. What that means is that when our rafters, we have five of them in this building, they're the things that transfer the load onto the wall. So at the points at which the, the rafters touch the wall, that's the point at which the wall wants to collapse. We can spread that load by distributing it using this beam or plate that goes along the whole length of the wall, we can spread that load so it's more equally shared across the wall, which gives us a greater structural integrity. Not buildings we can build with concrete or metal as well, that makes it much easier to distribute that load. But with Neolithic technology, um, we're limited to wood, we're limited to stone, wooden and bone tools. Um, and we as builders are limited in our capacity to build an effective building. Essentially, we decided what we would do is do away with a wall altogether. And that's the reason that this house has an A-frame construction. We didn't feel confident in being able to build a wall based on the evidence that we have from the archaeology that was two metres high, tied together with a wall plate and securely jointed, given the abilities that we had and the technology um, at hand. So we've built this house with an A-frame and no walls. It's really important to say that that doesn't mean that the original house at Horton looked anything like this. We're fairly confident that this is the shape of the house in terms of its ground plan, but we're not at all confident that this is the form of the house, that it was an A-frame. It may well have had walls. We know from other archaeology that Neolithic builders had exceptional carpentry school skills. I think we'd be surprised in the modern day, most of us would be very surprised to see uh, the sort of carpentry that comes out of the Neolithic. However, we're not Neolithic carpenters um, and we don't know that high level of carpentry skills was widespread. So we've made an assumption again that this house may have just been built by a local community. We don't know their carpentry skills. So we've done quite a, a simple build, not a primitive build, not a caveman build, but a simple build, making a structure that we know is sound and very likely to stand the test of time, not blow over in the wind, not fall down on people like me who stand on it. So we've gone for that very simple approach. We have still done some carpentry. Um, we've used Scots pine here. It's a timber that was known um, to be in Britain in the Neolithic, so it's quite appropriate for use. It grows long, fast and straight, so it's, it's quite a good structural building material. It has been shaped um, in some cases with flint axes. So as part of our experiment, an entire frame, one of the frames that we've used in this building, so a, a roof truss with the collars up here that tie it together, an entire one of those has been built using only bone tools, stone tools and wooden tools. We use flint axes, we use bone drills and we use wooden mallets. They prove very, very effective, um, even with our complete inexperience using that type of tool before. I've used power saws, modern hammers, modern axes, but never flint tools before. We were all very surprised at how effective that was. So in the space of one day, we could build a complete truss frame in this house. So the use of, um, use of these, I guess you'd call them period appropriate tools, so flint axes, wooden mallets, uh, bone chisels and bone drills, um, was important because as an experiment we need to be able to prove certain things and one of those things is that this structure could be built. Um, it's fairly pointless if we take to it with power saws and modern iron tools. We know we can build that, that's not an experiment. But to do it uh, as fairly unskilled labour, fairly efficiently, was proof that the concept worked. Now, it involved shaping the timbers to some degree, so cutting them to length. It involved drilling holes through them using the bone drills, we'll call them. Um, 
That allowed us then to pin these timbers together. So there's some slight jointing. We, we cut some very shallow joints or really knots as you would say to allow the, the timbers to, to bond together under friction a little bit better rather than using timber in the round um, which is uh, as you'd guess round timber which can roll a little bit under wind load. To secure it further we then drilled holes in the main timbers, so the ones that are taking most of the load, we drilled holes in them so wherever the, wherever the timbers cross we have holes and a, a, an oak peg that goes through there. Um, then we've lashed them together with rope in our case but we also experimentally made what's called cordage and cordage is where you take a, a fibre like a grass fibre or the fibres you get from nettles or tree bark those sorts of things twist it together and make a string or a rope all of those things we proved experimentally and with human labour so those frames were, were built completely on the ground because that's the obvious way to do it um, but clearly they needed to get through 90 degrees and get up into the air so we had uh, could build ourselves a house. Um, that was done again completely with human labour. Um, what we did was we, we, dug, we dug post holes and we dug post holes in exactly the same location relevant to our building um, that they were found in the archaeology. Um, we dug a little, a couple of little what you call slots uh, or trenches that, that led into the post holes. We then dragged our frames over and put them by those holes and made another small A-frame. So we made a small lifting device which acted as a fulcrum or a lever. Um, it resembled very much a small version of the A-frames that support the house. With the the frames of the house lying on the ground and our lever at 90 degrees in the air, we, we secured ropes to the, to the lifter, to the A-frame lifter, and we secured the other ends to the frames by, by getting a team of people to sort of pull on that, um, on that lifting fulcrum, we were able to sort of drag our A-frame into the slots. Once it jammed in the post holes, it just erected and went vertical really quite simply, really quite easily. And it only took us probably 10 minutes to erect each one of these large frames. And each one of those probably weighs about 500 kilograms. It, I say easily, but it did take a good coordinated group of people. So in the order of 10 people, some of them just putting grunt into it to lift it up, others securing it at the end so it didn't move and it didn't go around, and one or two others to make sure it got into the right position in the post holes and stood vertically. And that sort of teamwork has really been a hallmark of the whole build. Once the frames are up, of course, there was quite a lot more to do. We had to tie all the frames together. So that means putting in a number of horizontal timbers called purlins. Then we could drop more rafters on. They're called common rafters. They don't bear any structural load, but they carry all of our thatch. The more components we put into the building, the stronger it becomes until we form a frame.